Hi, I'm Reggie Turner. I'm here with Jim Miller and Terrence Moore. The flip side starts right now. Welcome to the show. Gentlemen, as they will say, the boys are back in town. Indeed. Good to be back. Good to be back. Tonight, we're excited to be with you. We are joined by Judge David Young, native Hagerstonian, 30-plus year retired Baltimore City Circuit Court Judge, and currently the president of the Robert W. Johnson Community Center. Judge Young, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Judge Young, first and foremost, um, obviously you're native Hagerstonian. Tell us a little bit about your childhood and your experiences here growing up. Uh, I, well, I had a great childhood. Uh, grew up on Sumas Avenue, which is not far from the Robert Johnson Center. I attended North Street School uh, from the first to the sixth grade. In 1963, they integrated the school, so uh, I went to North Potomac, then I went to North High, I went to Hagerstown Community College, and then uh, the UM, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Maryland Law School, and so, but I had a wonderful child, uh, childhood. I had a very loving, encompassing community. Uh, everybody went to church on Sunday, uh, and, and so uh, despite the political circumstances at the time, segregation was still in effect uh, until the 60s, but notwithstanding that, it was a very loving, encompassing, encouraging, embracing community. So my mother was one of 14, and I had <laughs> I had dozens and dozens of cousins. I still have quite a few. And so on Sundays, everybody met at Big Mama's house for dessert. And uh, so it was, it, was, it was a great upbringing. Excellent. Jim. What do you remember about the community back then? What are some of the striking memories you have of, of growing up in Hagerstown? Well, I remember we couldn't go to the movies. Uh, I remember that uh, when, we, when we could finally go to the Colonial and the Maryland, we had to sit in what was called the crow's nest. They made us go upstairs and uh, you could not, there was no integration, uh, separate lines at the concession stands. Uh, I remember you couldn't go in the McCroy's stores on uh, Washington Street and you couldn't try on clothes. I remember uh, you couldn't go into restaurants. They handed your food out the back. But I also remember uh, Wheaton Park. I remember Charles Stepp Washington. He started a little league because the little leagues were segregated at the time. I remember learning to swim at the Robert Johnson Community Center. I remember Boy Scouts at the Robert Johnson Community Center. I remember getting my first library card from the Washington County Library at eight. Mm -hmm. I remember being thrown into the pool at the Robert Johnson Community Center by Jurgens Kent, who became Dr. Jurgens Kent. And that's how they taught you to swim back in those days. They just say, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. And they, they pitch you in and they were lifeguards, but, but you, learn to, you learn to swim. Uh, but I also, just remember how everybody slept with their doors open. Uh, nobody had a key to their house because nobody locked, locked their doors. And we used to go to visit my grandmother in New Jersey and never locked, never locked our doors. I remember my parents went away one week per summer to Atlantic City. Now, why my dad went to Atlantic City every single year, we couldn't <laughs> figure it out. But they went to Atlantic City, and uh, but but I had a, an older brother who's now deceased, so he was kind of like the enforcer. Uh, I have a sister who's a year older than me; she was the mother. Uh, but the neighbors on each side, we lived in public housing, so the neighbors looked out for your children. We didn't have any 
quote, babysitters. My mother would tell Miss Lil and Miss Clark, I'm going to the grocery store. And they say, okay, we got them. And they would come check on you. So I remember uh, being disciplined by anybody in the community. If you got out of line, your butt was community property. <laughs> and uh, I remember Robert Johnson, uh, who just somebody needs to write a book or do a movie about his life. He was a father to hundreds. And he had some, he has his own children, but he always found time for kids in the community. So uh, he was a coach, uh, but I also found out the tough way. He was a strict disciplinarian. And so, but at, in those days, uh, we didn't fear the police. We feared Coach Johnson, Mr. Hudgens, Step Washington, William Campbell, the men in the community, because if they saw you downtown doing something you shouldn't do, they just parked the car, dragged you in the car, drove you home. <laughs> uh, I got weapons from people in our neighborhood who then re snitched to <laughs> my dad and I got whipped again. So that's what I remember. Definitely a, a different time from today. It's, it's a huge contrast. But at the same time, um, in the time that I've known you, a lot of that was instilled in you as being a disciplinarian, as um, being a mentor, being someone of guidance. Um, so I want to thank you for the relationship that I've had with you um, because there's few times you, you hesitate to pull me by my collar and pull me aside and give me a word of wisdom or correction as well. So I think those men for instilling in you and um, you carrying that forward as well. And I hope I, and I can be half the man um, you and those men have been um, to your community. Uh, but with that said as well, there's, there's a shift. Um, that leadership by example, that leadership amongst community isn't there across the country. And I'm not just you know, s speaking here locally. Um, what do you think contributes to that, especially being a man who went from a position of being living through segregation to a man who sat on the bench and dictated laws when laws were the reason why you were segregated? Um, part of it I attribute to government policy, quite frankly. Uh, in the 60s, we had reforms, quote, reforms. And uh, they changed the laws and said that in order for a family to get public assistance, the father either had to pay, be current in child support, as I recall, or be absent from the home. And so uh, it didn't work. Uh, because I knew people in where we lived, the, the dad came every night at 10 o'clock. But notwithstanding that, uh, I think people underestimate the importance of having strong male presence in, in the home or, and you know, my dad, he worked three jobs sometimes. He wasn't always present, but he was present. And uh, despite everything, I, I, that we didn't have a perfect family, no perfect families, but the one thing I'll always be grateful for, he was there. And so when we have policies that say, you can't be there, or we're gonna take their, their housing or take their assistance, you undermine. The other thing is, is that, and I've, when I, when I published my book, uh, I, I was also a pastor, so I have this book in me. I've done some research on the church's role in reducing youth violence. The church has a role to play. And so just as there are positive risk factors, there are negative risk factors. And so a negative risk factor is substance abuse in the home, uh, poverty, food insecurity, you know, in all these insecurities, domestic violence.
but a positive risk factor is an affiliation. Uh, I've said this many times, I was in juvenile court for 12 years. The gangs and the Boy Scouts are two trains running down the same track in different directions. The Boy Scouts have their handbook. Gangs have a Bible. Every member of the gang's got to remember the handbook. Uh, Boy, Scou Boy Scouts take an oath to God and country. Uh, gangs do too. They take an oath to the gang. Uh, Boy Scouts say, I will do my best to uphold and to serve. Gangs say, I will do everything I can to disrupt. Uh, Boy Scouts say your allegiance is to God and country. Gangs say your allegiance is to this gang. And I've had gang mem members literally assault their mothers because the gang leader said, if you don't do her, we're going to do you. And so another positive risk factor is a community center. It's been shown that when there is a place, when home is not available if you have somewhere you can go. Uh, and that's why it saddens me that in Baltimore, we went through like a 15 year period where they closed the community centers. And I said to the then mayor, you just gave the gangs a foothold. Because if there's a void, if people aren't engaged in pro-social activity, they will engage in antisocial activity. And that's why I'm excited about, you know, the possibilities at the Johnson Center. Another uh, pro-social uh, uh, factor is studies have shown that one competent, caring adult can change the trajectory of your life. Just one, you don't, you don't, and kids don't care if it's a parent, an uncle, if they have one person that says, I'm your ride or die, I'm here for you. Now the problem is, where are the mentors? Where are the after school programs? Where are the community centers? And I'm not talking about Robert Johnson, I, I, I drive all across Hagerstown. Where are the community centers? Where are the Boy Scouts? You know, and we had, you're fortunate to have little legs, but you don't have as many kids participating as you had now. Sports get a bad rap. But when we grew up, we had the Summer Basketball League, the Junior Basketball League. When North High played South High, every kid in those schools went to the games. My Great nephews played. I went to the game. I called my sister and said, I'll be there early because I want to make sure I get a good seat. She said, you won't have a problem getting a seat. So when we got to North High, there was nobody in the stands except the parents. And so what happened is we've given people access to cell phones and all of this, and people don't have pro-social skills. I mean, I, I see it in my grandchildren. Try to carry on a conversation with them without them every 15 seconds looking at their uh, the devices. Technology. Yeah. yeah. And so all of those things have, have, have hurt us. And uh, we just, the, the final thing is, even in a segregated town, growing up segregation, people were civil towards each other. They were. I mean, you understood the rules. You understood where you couldn't go. You understood where you had to be by sundown. But you didn't have this open hostility that we now have in this country on race. It's not just race. It's gender. It's politics. And, I, you know, I say we, don't, we just don't like anybody. You know, we don't even <laughs> like our daggone selves, you yeah. know. And so all of those things have, have hurt us. Those are a lot of the things that we grapple with on this show. And Jim, you've, you've, you've echoed some of those same things in regards to your frustrations. Jump back in. Yeah, I, you are singing to the, singing to the choir, Amen. so to speak, <laughs> with me, because that's exactly what I feel. And I think, I think the destruction of the family, not just in the black community, but across all communities, I think that the fact that we judge someone 
not only by the color of their skin sometimes now, but also whether they have a D or an R behind their name. Absolutely. Or uh, we judge them by this, this whole sexual orientation thing. We judge them on all these things that have nothing to do with what kind of person they are. And we make these judgments without even talking to them. And we have the media. I'm not trying to make a speech here. <laughs> We have the media that just, the Democrats do this, and the Republicans do Absolutely. this, and the As African Americans do monolithic. Right, exactly, Absolutely. and they're not. Yeah. They're not. I am a registered Republican, but I'm not a very, you know, I don't believe everything they say, and I don't believe everything the Democrats say. I'm, I believe what I believe. And because people are balkanized now, they wonder why young people don't vote. Why people don't bother? Well, they're apathetic them. because nothing gets done. Well, and because we're single issue. Right, we are, and we spend we spend the entirety of our political careers trying to get the other guy, not trying to help the community that we're serving. And mm -hmm. on top of that, we get to learn about one another based on a profile nine <coughs> out of ten times. Yep. Where you have to put yourself in categories and groups. You don't get to know the person. You usually know about someone's profile. You know about their political affiliation, which is on, you know, in social media. You know about, you know, it, you know what religion and, and, you know, their race, their ethnicity. All these categories we've given to people to put themselves in, that's how we learn about individuals. We no longer have the conversations. Right. Yeah. We no longer talk and, know, and learn people's hearts. Right, and learn who they are as an individual, we first learn what categories they associate themselves with before we even choose to have a conversation with them. And that has carried on and it has impacted our community. And now we're starting to impact our laws. Yep, right? it and, is. And we are, laws are now putting in place to build that infrastructure and maintain that infrastructure as well. And so I want to throw this to you again, Judge, as far as these laws that are coming out and being, you know, sitting there and watching the progression of law from, you know, from your youth to your time of service, how do you feel about what's happening in, from the legal standpoint and judicial standpoint? I think the judicial system is crumbling, just like the family is crumbling, just like our education system is crumbling, just like uh, our religious, not system, but, 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 uh, uh, the role of religion is diminished and that's because everything is re and everyone is reduced to a sound bite. I don't have to get to know you. I can look at you and be, as soon as I look at you I make, I make a judgment right. or I ask you one or two questions and you answer those one or two questions and that's all I need to know, know about you. And so when people get tuned, turned off, they tune out. And so anybody can come up the road, uh, and we got some gifted man politicians who are good at manipulating. Many of them. The electorate. I mean, it's now not about what I'm gonna do when I get to Washington to Annapolis, it's who I'm gonna get. Right. You're sending me there, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get them. And so that's what that's what people hop on. And they run they run based on they that. Run theory. Absolutely. Right. And when they get there, that's all they have to do is convince my constituents. You know, it's funny the other day because I was looking at uh, 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 MSNBC, and you know, one political party, so not to be partisan, is attacking the uh, the 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 uh, current administration's infrastructure plan. Oh, we got, oh, it's, it's waste, it's boondoggle. And the very people who did it, uh, who were from Georgia and Florida and Texas, are taking tens of millions of dollars in earmarks back home. Right. See, so, but they won't go back home and say, this is a result of the, the infrastructure plan. You know, that they will go back home and say, I delivered. And, and, and oh, by the way, these guys are spending too much money. Right. But I delivered. Right. But it, it's but okay it, for me. And an uninformed, that's the danger. I said this to, to a judge today on the phone. At North High, you had to take civics. Mm -hmm. They don't have civics. People don't understand the basic operation of government. They don't understand 
who makes the laws. They don't understand how laws are enacted. And so these people are like, the damn judges. It's the crooked politicians. Well, you sent them there, you know? And, and, and there's a framework, but they don't understand the framework. And the politicians don't want them to understand the framework because an, an educated, enlightened electorate might hold me accountable. Right, yeah. Judge Young, I, I wanna hold here. I, I, there's, there's two things that I really want us to dive into when we come back. Number one, talking about your journey from Suman's Avenue to becoming a judge. Uh, th that, that in itself is a book. Um, and then the other thing, you grew up with Coach Robert Johnson. You grew up with the community center. And I want to really dive into the impact that that's had on you and why you choose to drive 100 miles to Hagerstown several times a week to be involved in your home community when you are retired and supposed to be living the good life. So think about those things. Don't, don't do it now. We're going to take a quick break. Oh, no. <laughs> and we want to come back and address some of those things. Fair enough? Yep. All right, excellent. Stay with us. We'll have more with Judge David Young after the break. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for staying with us. Judge David Young, thank you for staying with us as well to talk more. Uh, Judge, I kind of teed this up before the break. Uh, from Suman's Avenue to a 30 plus year career as a judge. Tell us that journey, because you know we, we all feel that is a book in itself. Okay. My mother was a domestic. My father drove a forklift. But my mother was a voracious reader. My father was one of the smartest people I ever met. My grandfather never got to finish high school, but he was, the, a, he was brilliant. He taught himself to read and write. He was one of the founders of the NAACP in Washington County, along with uh, Reverend Leonard Curlin and others. And so when I was nine years old, I had five brothers and sisters. And every Saturday, my mother would go to the library. And uh, I finally figured out when I was nine, gee, if I go to the library, I don't have to share her with these other people. So I started, my mother and I went to the library every Saturday. Well, I started going to the library, and one day I found a book called So You Want to Be a Lawyer. And my wife actually bought me a copy of it. I have it home. And I got it to Washington County Public Library. And I read it, and it juxtaposed with the segregation in Hagerstown, uh, my father being called boy, my mother being called out of her name, and I just said, I'm gonna be a lawyer. So my mother cleaned law offices, and uh, my uncle cleaned law offices. So I used to tag along, but I didn't empty the trash can. I would go in the lawyer's office and pull their law books off the shelf and start reading their law books. And one of the lawyers that my uncle worked for was a lawyer named uh, Irvin Einbinder, oh whose office was on uh, uh, Washington, uh, Franklin Street. So I used to read his books. Okay, so I told, the, told uh, my teachers at North High I was going to be a lawyer. They patted me on the head and said, that's real good. <laughs> I went to Hagerstown Community College. I said, I think I want to be a lawyer. They said, yeah, that's going to be real good. I told my professors at the University of Maryland, I want to go to law school. They say, nope, not for you. Law school's for the best and the brightest. So I had one counselor, Al Joyner, he's 95, I just spoke to him, who said, young, nothing beats a failure but a try. If you don't apply, you will not get in. That's the only thing certain. Well, long story short, I applied. So, but when I got in, I didn't have any money. So, and my mother was domestic, and the woman she was the, uh, worked for was Dorothy Byron Lane. Dorothy Byron Lane was the widow of William Preston Lane, governor of Maryland. But at the time, the University of Maryland Law School was named after William Preston Lane. So Mrs. Lane said to my mother, what's David gonna do? 
She said, well, he got in, but we don't have any money. So she said, what law school did he get in? I said, my mother said he got in Maryland. She said, oh, I know Mike Kelly, he's the dean. And did I tell you the law school's named after my husband? So she made a call. They told me, come to the law school the next day. I went to the law school. They said, don't worry about it. Uh, we're going to find the money. And I said, well, good, but what am I going to do this semester? And they said, your tuition's been paid. Mrs. Lane paid my tuition. But <laughs> not only that, I worked at Potomac Edison every summer. Her nephew was the, uh, Mr. McArdle was the VP and general manager of Potomac Edison. So every summer, two summers, I worked in substation shoveling mud out, you know, out of substations. But when I was in law school, they hired me in the legal department which is great because I tooled around Hagerstown all summer in a company car, thought I was a big shot. <laughs> but but uh, it was, it, it, I mean, you know, uh, I'm not a self-made man. The good Lord looked out for me. Doors were open that I didn't even know they were there. But I will say two things. I had an encouraging mother and I had Coach Johnson. Now I've told this story. When I became a judge, a Coach Johnson thought I was a little rough around the edges. <laughs> so Coach Johnson commanded the respect of everybody, white and black, tall, fat, skinny. He would walk in the gym, take out his whistle, blow the whistle three times. That meant sit down, set up, and shut up. And Coach Johnson was only about five foot seven, five foot eight. <clears throat> but to see Coach Johnson drag somebody your size to the floor, right and your size and he was a tuskegee airman and he and he told us you know man i've dealt with tougher guys than you so so anyway when i became a judge i invited him i i i, I chartered a bus a busload of people came from hagerstown to my investiture and coach johnson looked at me and he said man when i look at you I know the good Lord's real, because I would have I would have predicted many things for you. This is not what I would have predicted, and and so. But I always had uh, aunts and uncles when I was in law school. They were domestics too, but they'd give me five dollars or ten dollars. And so I, I tell young people, I got a lot of. I'm mentoring a young man at University of Maryland now a woman at the University of Maryland Law School right now, a woman at the University of Baltimore right now, but you gotta pay back. Mm. And one person can make a difference. One, one person, and all of my law clerks are doing great. One of my law clerks is a uh, direct, executive director of global philanthropy for J.P. Morgan Chase. And I have law clerks in private practice. I have law clerks in the Justice Department. And they're my kids. And all it takes is a touch. And so Robert Johnson Center, we just want to touch these kids. That's all. If you touch them, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> you talk, that amazing story, uh, amazing story. Why not go into politics? Because my mother made me promise never to. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I worked in, I, I, I'm a politician at heart. When I was at the University of Maryland, I worked in George McGovern's campaign for president. We know how that turned out, but I was a campus coordinator. But I also worked in Jimmy Carter's campaign. I worked for Milton Allen, who was elected state's attorney in Baltimore City. I worked for Kurt Schmoke. He was the first elected African-American male uh, mayor in Baltimore. I worked for a lot of uh, politicians. I love the strategy. I love the, uh, the, the chess moves. I, I love it all. Uh, and, and I worked with a, uh, when I was in law school, Professor Larry Gibson, he's still around. He called, him, called us Larry's Army. He got all the law students involved. But his, what he did was he started you out knocking on doors. Then you got, el you got promoted to, uh, to a, uh, uh, he called them area captains. 
So on election day, you were responsible for a bunch of precincts. You had to put together your materials. You had to get out the T-shirts. You had to bag the lunches. And, uh, but also, he showed you, he, he called it the war room. He had all his maps. He showed you how to figure out where the registered voters were, where the unregistered voters were, the Republicans were, the Democrats were. And uh, I loved it. And I thought about, you know, running for mayor. And my mother said, please don't do that. It's too dirty. And all they do is assassinate each other's characters. Mm -hmm. They don't care about, your, you know, how good you are. And they don't care about, you know, what you're interested in. And uh, she would always say, remember politics. If they can't control you, they will destroy you. Mm. And that's, so, so I, I didn't. But as a judge, you had to run for election. So three times I was in the ballot in Baltimore City. And I loved it. I loved going to churches, community groups, man, dinners. <laughs> I went to so many chicken dinners, I stopped eating chicken for a long time because every politician has a chicken dinner. You know, chicken cordon bleu, roast chicken, baked chicken, fried chicken. So, but, but some nights I was at five or six events and I loved it I, because I think judges, every elected official ought to be in the community. Your constituents ought to know who you are. And if you can't stand the heat, Get out the kitchen. And uh, the judiciary had a speaker's bureau. I sign up every year. Send me. And I went to, and people attacked the judiciary. I explained them how the juvenile court worked, the circuit court worked, why judges weren't all powerful. But I think that, that, that if you're an elected official, including a judge, you, you work for those people. And my mama used to say, Boy, you better be kind to the people who come before you because there before the grace of God go you. It could be you. And she said, uh, let, me, let me find out you were not courteous. Story real quick. I was in Hagerstown. A woman had broke her husband's arm in a domestic dispute. So I took my mother to court with me one day. She said, I want to see you in court. Then we were going to the Broad Acts to have lunch. Well, when they told me how this couple was always engaged in combat and she broke the man's arm, I put her in jail. So we go to lunch and my mother's not speaking. And I said, Mom, how's your food? She didn't speak. I said, are you enjoying court? She didn't speak. So I said, Mom, what's wrong? And my mother looks at me and says, you got a lot of nerve. You put that woman in jail this close to Christmas. And she got, didn't you hear her say she, she got four kids? And did you hear that man say he came home drunk and he started it? She said, I, I'm through with you. So true story. That afternoon, I went back to court. I had the woman brought back from jail. I begged her, don't go back to the house. You know, if he's drinking, please stay away from each other. He said he would stay away from her, and I, and I, and I let her. I, I gave her probation instead of jail. But I looked at my mother and said, you can't come to court no more. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, before we jump into other things, you're up. I have, I have, a I have many. But you're, I'll, you're, ready, I'll, you're ready to vote for him, right? I'll <laughs> limit it. Yeah, I'll vote for you for sure. I will limit it. So, so first of all, the first thing that strikes me about your initial story is, you know, if you read, and I, I love to read quotes, right? I love to read famous people quotes, and the ones that are recurring, the recurring themes are, number one, if you don't try, you're never going to make it. Yep. Number two, the only way to success is to work hard. There are no, there are no other options. And number three, as on a community basis, accept the help that the community is willing to give you, and then when you succeed, give it back to others. And all three of those elements are so very clear in the story that you just told. Um, I, I think that a lot of people will watch this episode and, and find, find a lot of incentive in that story. Well, 
Here's, here's one of the re ways I got to the Robert Johnson Center. I saw on Facebook, I, I retired as a pastor in 2020, 2019. In 2019, I also decided I would not return to the court as a senior judge. I just seen too much, done too much. So I'm sitting around and about a year and a half or two years ago, I see this thing on Facebook about the Robert Johnson Center. Wasn't all that complimentary. Uh, and so I said, man, I got to do something. So ironically, like two weeks later, I get a call from Senator Joanne Benson. Now, Senator Joanne Benson <laughs> used to run the Wheaton Park Playground when I was a little boy. And I had the privilege of running the Wheaton Park Playground in the summers. So Senator Benson used to send me home every day. She said, go home and don't come back till tomorrow because I was, you know, I had a few issues back then. <laughs> so, so, but she said, I need, you, I need you to get involved. I need you to just go up there. Now, I'd been tricked that way many times because Judge Robert Watts in Baltimore said, young man, I need you to go to a meeting at the Y. So I went to one meeting and I was a Y volunteer for 15 years. <laughs> so I understand when people say I need you to go to a meeting, but I, I, I attended that meeting and I saw commitment. And I don't care any about any of the criticism. If you can't take criticism, don't do it. But I saw the commitment from Reggie Turner. I saw the commitment from the other board members. And I said, I want to get involved. See, and so, uh, but Senator Benson has, she's just one of my heroes. I followed her when she was a school teacher in Prince George's County. And let me tell you, there's a saying it take, you got to break eggs to make mayonnaise. Right. Joanne Benson is not afraid to break eggs to make mayonnaise. And she, you know, she, her whole life, she's the daughter of a preacher. She don't mince words. She comes at you dead on. <laughs> what you see is what you get. And so she said, go. And, and I came, and I'm glad I came. Uh, my wife is getting suspicious because I'm in Hagerstown so often, <laughs> but actually she's happy to have me out of the house. But, uh, but, but um, I think Hagerstown has a lot of promise. Yes. It's just there. But either we pull together or we pull apart. Mm -hmm. And there's this undercurrent in Hagerstown that you know, we, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pull this thing apart because we don't agree with it. Well, as I told the people I counseled in marriage, politics and marriage is the art of compromise. Nobody gets everything they want all the time, yeah. and in politics and marriage, <clears throat> now I'm talking not condoning domestic violence. This is. Figurative, not literal. You take a licking and you keep on ticking. When things go wrong in politics or in life, uh, we're all survivors. You pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, and you get back in the game. And we're all, the, the real winners in life are the ones who manage to get back in the game. I have one final question. This is a tough one. If you talk, we, you've talked about the family mm -hmm. being pulled apart. You've talked about the communities being pulled apart. You've talked about politicians being pulled apart. We have clearly swung the pendulum way, way over to an area that's not good. How do we get it back? As a pastor, I would tell you, follow the good book. Love one another. That's all. And, and love is not... Uh, being best buds. Love isn't always huggy, huggy, but love is commitment. Yeah. When you're married, things, things don't go right. You don't throw in the towel. You say, I've made a commitment. Yeah. 
I'm going to stick with this thing. And if you stick with it, if you're determined to stick with it, I'll guarantee you, your latter, your, uh, latter days will be better than your former days. And so as a nation, I mean, it just, I can't tell you how it disturbs me because I've been to different countries and I've gotten off that plane and kissed the ground because I've seen what they have and they want what we have. And they come here hoping for what we take, take for granted. Yeah. And so I just wish we could put maybe about 40 million people on a plane and send them to these other countries where people have nothing. I mean nothing. When you think poverty, uh-uh. We, we have some poor people in poor places in this country, but if you could see some of these other countries, they have nothing. They have the clothes on their backs, which are tattered. And so we, we have been blessed by God, and, 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 and I'm not ashamed of my, my uh, religion, religiosity, people call it, spirituality. But man, just look around. If we don't learn to live together as brothers and sisters, we're gonna perish as fools. And that's the epilogue from, from the Ship of Fools. Uh, and we're perishing right before our very eyes. We can see this nation crumbling because we won't get off our high horse, walk across the room and have a conversation. I'd rather sit over here and throw rocks at you and call you names than come over here and say, Look, Jim, we're about to lose this thing. What can we do together to make sure we don't? Right. Wow. Judge Jim, let's take a quick break. I, I, wanna, I wanna jump in with you in regards to your role with the community center, where it is, where you see the future going, and your vision and your role as president. So stay with us, everyone. We'll have more with uh, Judge David Young after the break. Welcome back to the show. Judge Young, thank you for staying with us. This has been an excellent show, very informative. Every time we talk, I get a history lesson, so thank you for that. Um, Judge Young, you have, you have came home, you have stepped up, um, you have become the president of the Robert W. Johnson Community Center. Um, I, I know that you, you are honoring the legacy of Robert W. Johnson and all that he's done in your life. I know you have told us all in regards to you work with Miss Ruth Ann Monroe um, when she ran the community center. Um, tell us a little bit about what the community center, the impact that it had on your life as a young man, and then start to transition and tell us about where things are now and where you see it going in the future. It was a safe haven. We could not afford, my mother could not afford for us to do much. But knowing that we could go there and swim for 25 cents. My mother made $30 a week. So for us to go swimming was a buck 25. But we went on our neighbor's porch, there is a statute of limitations, and took their soda bottles because in those days you could cash in soda bottles for money. So we would collect soda bottles. But, but it was, you didn't have to worry about where your kids were. And we would leave the center and go to the boys club because the boys club was open seven to nine. So the center closed <coughs> at five, but your parents knew there were caring, competent adults. Uh, we got to go on scouting trips. Mr. Mitchell, uh, Carolyn Williams' grandfather, uh, Mr. Williams, he, uh, Mr. Mitchell ran the Y, but Mr. Andrew Williams had the scout troop. And so we learned, we learned scouting. We learned first aid. We learned to clean up the community. It, you know, if, if you live in a community, why can't you pick up the trash in your community? 
and I'm a great believer, don't ask the good Lord to do what you can do for yourself. Don't ask the government to do what you can do for yourself. You can clean up your own community. Just clean up around your house, you know? And uh, you can go to restore. They'll give you some paint. Slap some paint on your house. I'll never forget during the Olympics when we went to Atlanta, they painted even the vacant houses. <laughs> so everybody coming to the Olympics saw, right? So we can, we can do those things for ourselves. But people have to feel connected. Young people don't feel connected. And when people don't feel connected, they are disruptive. And, you know, our, at the center, we're going to re reconnect the connection. I thought about that today. I don't know how that's going to become a part of our mission statement. But there is a history to build on. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Reconnect people with that center. And, and my vision, uh, it's not my vision, because I pray every day for the center and, and the community around it. But what I see is, I see, and I, I, go to, I woke up this morning at, at 7 o'clock, because I didn't go to sleep till 4 o'clock, because I thought about coming here. That's the truth. And, uh, but I can see people coming down North Street, coming up North Street, coming this way on Sumans, coming to the center. And it is a beacon. There is a light. You know, we don't have a church steeple, but we need a light. We need something that says, come here. You know, you know come here. And that, that's all I hope to be. And, you know, I'm excited. I'm so excited about the opportunity to renovate. I'm so excited about some of the program opportunities that are being presented that I'm sure you'll share later. But uh, cheer up, get ready folks. You know, the, the, best is, the best is yet to come. You ain't seen nothing yet. You know, uh, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna do it. And let those who say it can't be done get the heck out of the way of the ones who are doing it. Amen. Now, Judge Young, you you know, right now you're doing a lot of heavy lifting <coughs> as we looking, as we begin to look for our, our next leader of the community center, you're standing in the gap in regards to that and you're overseeing a multi-million dollar renovation that's about to happen of the center. The, the project that we've been working on is the, the, the pool. The pool is a $600,000 renovation. Talk about just the pool itself. What did it mean to you as a kid? You talked about being thrown in. But talk about what it meant to you and what it's going to mean to the community when that, when it, that is done. It means you can learn to swim. It means that when it's 90 degrees, it meant that when it was 90 degrees, we could leave the Wheaton Park playground at 1 o'clock and go swimming. We could go swimming for a couple of hours, go back to the playground. But it meant it was structure. And, and, and I, I'll say it again, without structure, man, we are reaping, for better or worse, the harvest. We have sown these seeds. Now we gotta reap the harvest. But it's not too late, folks, to turn the ship around. All you gotta do is roll up your, your sleeves and get, get involved, you know? It, you don't have to do everything, but you have to do something. And if you choose to sit on the sideline and do nothing, what you get is what you get. And, and so I refuse to believe that this is my hometown. I refuse to believe it. Well, and you yeah. talked about connect connections, and you talked about you know, to, to create those community connections. And my theory is, and I think you espoused it earlier, young people will have connections. They're either going to be good connections in the community or they're going to be those gang connections or connections maybe not with a bank, gang, with, but with people that are not doing good. Right. So th it's going to happen one way or the other. It's happening. It's, it, it's, it, it's up to us, the adults, to provide them the ability to make the good Absolutely. connections. Absolutely. Absolutely. I heard you talk about the pool and just the analogy. Something that resonated with me, with me was you were thrown into the deep end to succeed, but you were surrounded by people who loved and instructed you. And, and they were the one that let you succeed and knew that you were ready for it even before you knew you were ready to do it. You got it. And that analogy of what that pool looks like and, 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 and also to come with the, the stereotype 
that African Americans can't swim or don't swim, and we know that's usually taught because of access. We don't have the access to pools. We don't have the access to be trained to swim in a lot of those ways. Um, what does the next generation see when they walk through that community center a year, five years from now? Expectation. That's all. The, our kids don't do well in school because we don't set expectations for them. If you tell your children you will succeed, you will go to school, you will get off of that social media, you will exercise, you will. But we give our children, what do you want to do today, Johnny? Oh, I'm a, I want to get on, on the, uh, I want to be a gamer. You know, expectations and dreams. My parents said, you will go to school. You will finish high school now. I didn't know I was going to go the rest of the way, but at least in those days, a high school diploma was the goal. And not only did they have expectations, they set goals for you. Nobody sets goals for these children. They have no goals to shoot for. So when they come to that center, if we have a computer lab and we have instructors, they can learn. Uh, you can learn. We can have relationships with the community college. We can have relationships with the hospital. Our children can look to health care professions because of the connection. They can look for, for to come in here and work for Antietam Cable because somebody introduced them to broadcast journalism. But if, if you don't expose kids, my mother exposed us $30 a week. She found the money to expose us, to take us on little trips, to take us to the library, to take us to the museum, to take us to see things. There's a big world outside of that community. And unfortunately, most Kids don't get to see that world out there. I mean, and I'll, I'll jump in one more quick time here. What's your message to the business community in support of community as a whole? You're going to pay now or you're going to pay later. Mm. You, we all have a choice. And I know that sounds harsh, but people are, if you don't, invest in construction, you will invest in reconstruction. You'll have to spend money repairing the damage. And we are all called by the good book to be repairers of the breach, to walk across the room and to make this world a better place. And I tell people, I tell government officials, you're going to pay now or pay later. Either you're going to pay by supporting a community center or you're going to pay with the $30,000 a year it costs to incarcerate. You get to choose. Amen. Judge Young, this has been amazing. This has been absolutely amazing. And I, I just want to take this opportunity to say I lost my father in 2017, but you have been a blessing on my life. And there are some things that are constant messages that you give me. Don't get distracted. Don't get discouraged. And you say it over and over to me. And I, and I used to get upset when you would say it. But then there would be times where I would be frustrated about something. And that little voice of yours is always in my ear. And I found myself starting to say it to myself. So in that little example, you've already taught me something of how to deliver that message to my son. Because he's going to need that one day. Absolutely. And I thank you for it. The other thing is a lot of times I get caught up in talking about the politics or the center or what's going on in other organizations I serve and you stop me and you says, wait a minute, aren't you on a volleyball trip? How are your daughter's doing? That's right. How's your son doing? How's your wife doing? When's your next date night? When you get married. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just those little touches of things that you do for us coming home and mentoring us of keeping the main thing the main thing. And I just want to say thank you Our for privilege. coming home and standing up. Um, and I feel that sense of responsibility to stay in the fight, yep. to move the ball forward, and to fight for community, no matter what naysayers and negative folks have to say, because this is not our work, it's the work of the Lord's. So thank you much for everything, and we appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you. Well, and we hope you will join us again, because I think the best way to make this, I think the best way that we can, I can serve 
and perhaps we can serve in this capacity is to get the word out about what's going on Absolutely. here. Absolutely. And people are not going to see the progress for a little while because you got all the internal things to do. It, you know, you, the construction, it doesn't look like a house in the first couple of months, right? Mm -hmm. It takes a while. And when they see it, they'll see it. But we don't want, we don't want the naysayers to Still the narrative. Derail exactly. Derail right. progress. Yeah. Because the problem is not just about this, but a lot of things. And I meant to say this back when we were talking about social media. A lot of the pe people that talk on social media are repeating something that at its core is not true. Absolutely. And they have no basis in reality. They're just repeating something that they heard. It's a, it's a talk track. Amen. So, thank, thank you. you. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. We hope that you'll like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and send us your comments to feedback at theflipsidetv.com. That is feedback at theflipsidetv.com. But most importantly, join us again next week for another episode of The Flipside.